In a recent paper by Leonard Susskind, he argues that the entanglement is not enough to capture the information behind the horizon of black holes. Entanglement is a very powerful tool and has been proven to be extremely useful in several branches of physics, but it is limited while probing the growth of wormholes connecting black holes. Instead, Susskind proposed quantum complexity to be a good alternative. In this video, I will explain to you the main argument of paper and why this might be a next big thing in physics. In fact, in the last five years, Susskind has published over 10 papers with the title Complexity on it, which proves that he is considering it seriously. In the description, you will find the links to relevant papers. Complexity is a well-developed subject in mathematics and computer science. It is a measure of how hard it is to go from point A to B. A and B can be anything. So far, complexity has not been a big deal in physics. In this regard, Susskind is the first one to propose it to be useful for physics too. Hayden and Harlow team had done something similar but Susskind is the first to give a rigorous statement on it. The main theme of his work is based around quantum information. So what makes quantum information different than classical one? The first one is the property of quantum entanglement. In quantum entanglement, you can know everything about the system but nothing about its parts. This is very non-trivial. The second one is that quantum computation has extremely huge computational complexity. Complexity theory has not been a big deal in physics. I suspect it's going to become a bigger deal than it has been. Complexity theory, oh, let me tell you first of all where it came from. It came from some deep mathematical questions. In fact, if I were to trace it back as far as I can, I think it originated in questions that Hilbert originally asked about um, the structure of the actual logic and structure of mathematics, which uh, progress was made by people thinking about computing. Not necessarily thinking about computing with modern computers, but the progress was made by Alan Turing, Alonzo Church, Gödel, von Neumann to some extent, and then after that a lot of uh, people who we tend to consider computer scientists, but I think they're very deep. I think the subject is a very deep mathematical subject, and um, I think it's coming into physics. I think it's coming into physics in a big way. Complexity theory is usually thought of as trying to classify or quantify how difficult a problem is. How difficult is it to solve a problem? Or how difficult is it to get from A to B, whatever A and B are? How hard is it? How many steps do you have to take? What's the minimum number of steps that you have to take to get from A and B to A to B? Uh, that's what complexity theory is about. It's not usually thought of, complexity is not usually thought of as a physical property, physical property of a system. Let's first discuss about entanglement in the context of black holes. Susskind and Maldacena had proposed the idea of ER equals EPR before. ER means einstein rosen bridge commonly known as Ohm hole, and EPR means einstein podolsky rosen experiment, which is known as entanglement. The idea of ER equals EPR conjecture is that, if you have two systems which are connected by Ohm hole bridge, then they are also entangled. In this way, entanglement represents the connectivity of space itself. One quick way to see this is via two entangled black holes. If you have two black holes that are entangled, you can measure the entanglement with entropy. But this entropy includes extra terms coming from the area of Ohm hole. So this implies that if you have two black holes entangled, they are also connected by Ohm hole behind the horizon. This is the reason behind the original paper of ER equals EPR by Maldacena and Susskind. So how do you make two entangled black holes? Okay. Now, how do you make entangled black holes? Can you make entangled black holes? Well, yes, of course you can make entangled black holes. You can make entangled anything. But um, w there's a couple of ways of making it that are interesting. The first way is pair creation of black holes. Now that's of course a crazy process, so we can't do this in the laboratory, but theoretically it should be possible. A pair of charged entangled black holes created by the Schwinger pair production process in a strong electric field, a pair of charged black holes can be created of arbitrary charge and mass. And when you work out the geometry of it, there's an instanton for it, when you work out the geometry for it, indeed you find that the geometry contains a wormhole connecting them, number one. And number two, you find out that the creation probability is only consistent if you assume the two black holes are maximally entangled. Maximally entangled or highly entangled wormhole. 
now there's another way you can make maximally and or highly entangled forget the, let's not worry about maximally entangled highly entangled black holes and this is highly quantum mechanical i can't draw you a geometry that goes with it entirely but it will go something like this start with a pair, start with a pair of clouds of particles that were alice's and bob's shares of entangled um, bell pairs each red connected by a black line represents a bell pair. Alice has half of them. Bob has the other half. They take them far, far away from each other, being careful not to um, spread the entanglement out into the environment. And then they collapse. Each one collapses their share. When they do that, they create two entangled black holes. One key thing about the Ohm hole bridge is that it grows with time. Growth of the volume of the Ohm hole is proportional to entropy of black holes. But the black holes are in perfect thermal equilibrium. Perfect thermal equilibrium means that the entanglement has maxed out and it cannot be increasing. So this is the main idea paper which says that entanglement is not sufficient to measure the growth of Ohm hole. So what quantity would grow long after equilibrium? This new quantity Soskin conjecture to be complexity. Let me begin with a classical example. The classical example begins with the cellular automaton. The cellular automaton, here's a cellular automaton. The uh, cell can either be red or white. And, if, and there are two simple states. When you think about complexity, the first thing to get straight is what you mean by simplicity. Before you can talk about complexity, you have to talk about simplicity. What's the simplest state that you can think of for a cellular automata? Well, the simplest thing I can think of is that all the squares are white or all the squares are red. I can state it in three words, all the same. So. That's simple. Okay. There's, there's some rules for the cellular automata. That I don't care what they are right now. Let's just assume they're more or less such that at each step of the cellular automata, only a small number of uh, bits or a small number of cells are simultaneously involved, uh, and nothing more than that. All right, the cellular automata evolves, and eventually it produces a state which is in some sense more complex. It's harder to describe. Uh, and there are many of them that look more or less the same, but, uh, but it's just a state, but in some sense it's more complex. How can we quantify the complexity? So I'm going to suggest now that we quantify the complexity by the following rule. We first identify a simple process. We have a simple state, and now a simple process. And a simple process should mean a process which involves a small number of bits simultaneously. The, what's the simplest process? The simplest process is a flip of a bit, a flip of a, um, of a cell. White goes to red, red goes to white. In fact, that, that's a reversible process. I'm interested in reversible cellular automata. So this is a simple process. I have the idea of a simple state and a simple process. And we can just define the complexity to be the minimum number of simple steps needed to get to the configuration. That is, in some sense, how hard it is to get to this configuration from a simple configuration, the minimal number of steps. Uh, now, we're not interested in the number of steps actually taken by the cellular automata. The cellular automata might go some crazy route to get to this configuration. The complexity of it is not defined by how long the cellular automata takes to get to that configuration. It's defined by what is the minimum possible number of steps that could have gotten you to this configuration. And this definition is fairly standard. Okay. If you are speaking in classical terms, complexity and entropy has similar expressions. The maximum complexity is of order n, and maximum entropy is also of order n. But this notion of classical computing is very misleading when it comes to quantum. First of all, the classical cellular automata is characterized by a bit string in binary digits. If I had a thousand uh, bits, I could easily lay out uh, a bit string on a piece of paper to represent the entire state of the thousand bits. It would take about half a page. Right? Quantum mechanically, each one of the classical states is a basis state. It's a basis state and which we are allowed now to superpose. So we can consider any superposition of these states. There are two to the n of them, and so the general quantum state is characterized by two to the n complex numbers. That's a lot more than here. This is what Feynman, this is what bugged Feynman. 
why quantum mechanics is so hard. Because just to write down the wave function of 400 qubits would fill the universe if you stuffed it plunky in density uh, full of, uh, full of uh, bits of information. OK, so in some sense, quantum states are more complex. Let's go now and try to define carefully what we mean by the complexity of a quantum state. First of all, again, we start with a simple state. A simple state means unentangled. All right. Unentangled, the simplest unentangled state would be all qubits. Now I'll use the term qubits, all qubits aligned. What's a simple process? Well, there are, there are single qubit um, unitary operators, they're called gates, a, simple, a single qubit gate that acts on only one qubit, but you can't get very far with single qubit gates. Why not? You can't create entanglement. So there's a very tiny fraction of states that you could get to by single qubit operators. But with two qubit operators, two qubit gates, two in, two out, unitary, you can pretty much get to any state. When I say pretty much, there are some epsilons and deltas that you have to be careful about, but, and uh, details count. But still, it's true that you can get to arbitrarily close to any state by a sequence of two qubit ga gates. All right, we replace the cellular automata by a quantum circuit, and the quantum circuit is just a sequence of gates, a sequence of gates between arbitrary qubits in some form. You start with a simple state, you, sub you run the quantum computer on it, or you run the quantum circuit on it, running it, applying these unitaries, until you get to the output state. The complexity of the output state is the minimum number of gates that it would take to go from the simple state to psi. Now, in quantum complexity, the maximum complexity is of order exponential n, while maximum entropy is of order n. This is an extremely huge difference. Furthermore, in order to achieve this maximum entropy, you only need log n times, but maximum entropy is achieved when you have thermal equilibrium. We can calculate it and in fact this is really quick, like milliseconds per black holes of solar mass. But time to reach this maximum complexity is of only of order exponential n. Here I've made a plot. Now this is a plot of expectations, not, uh, not a plot of anything I can prove. Uh, I'll talk about what, what can and can't be proved if I have time at the end. All right, vertically, I either plot entropy uh, of a system which is undergoing some, pro some, some um, evolution from a simple state, and I plot complexity. Entropy will max out at log n, at, uh, sorry, at um, n log 2. There is no way that you can have more entropy than order n. That will just max out. The complexity will continue to increase for an exponential time, now as I said, this, 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 this is difficult to prove, and I'll come back to that. But the best guess is that it increases linearly for a long period of time with a coefficient that is proportional to the number of bits in the system. Why? Well, the more bits you have, the more complex uh, you'll get after a certain amount of time. And the temperature, and the temperature is just there because the temperature provides a rate. The higher the temperature, the faster the collisions between things and so forth. So this is a theorem called the Margulies-Levitin theorem, which uh, basically justifies uh, this, uh, this kind of formula here. And the time rate of change of complexity, and this potentially can go on until the complexity maxes out. The complexity maxes out at an exponentially long time. We have now two formulas. Rate of the change of complexity increases for long time, and then it increases linearly with area. Volume of the ohm hole also increases linearly with area. With this, we can speculate that the volume of ohm hole is proportional to complexity. And this shows that entanglement is not enough and we need some other quantity and this quantity can be complexity.